City University Television. In association with the Center for Advanced Study in Theater Arts. And the Harold Plurman Endowment. Present Spotlight. Welcome to the Harold Clarman Seminar on Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest is one of America's foremost playwrights, Edward Albee. Edward, welcome. Good to see you again. Very nice to have you here. In your play, Seascape, it's sometimes referred to as a sort of quartet, musical quartet. And in the play Delicate Balance, Tobias has a long speech toward the end that you refer to in the stage directions as an aria. Mm -hmm. Do you sometimes think of your plays in musical terms? Do you, uh, do you have some analogy between music and playwriting sure in your do. own mind? When I was um, 12, I think, and I discovered Mozart and Bach, I decided uh, since they could do it, I should too, and I should be a composer. But I was either too lazy or too incompetent to learn how to read music very well or play the piano, so I didn't become a composer. But after I discovered I was a playwright, I be slowly began to realize that writing a play is, has a lot in common with writing a piece of music, writing a string quartet. Um, the characters are instruments. Themes, ideas, and, and musical themes uh, are quite related. Even though you don't get the simultaneity of, a, of three or four people speaking at the same time, you have the illusion of string quartet writing. The structure of a play, the literal structure of a play and, and the structure of a string quartet can quite often be the same. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of similarities. They are both performed um, out loud pieces. And a playwright notates very much the way a composer does. When a composer wants something loud, he puts triple forte. When a playwright wants something loud, he either underlines it or capitalizes it. I began to discover analogies running, running all the way through. And if I, I think that if I didn't have my enormous absorption with classical music, uh, which I know very, very well, uh, I probably wouldn't have uh, been aware of these, uh, and I probably wouldn't have uh, been able to write uh, the kind of play that I like to write. Has this been a lifelong love of yours, classical oh, music? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. And, and have you gone now? It, do you have a lot of equipment to, to play this, or are you... Well, uh, I've got a good sound system. Yeah. And <laughs> and, uh, have you gone into the CDs oh, now? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. And then, now that I've gone into CDs, they're going to give me something else that's going to make the CDs uh, obsolete. Oh, that's right. Obsolete. Very, very but you do... Too. So you listen to music a great deal. Oh, I then. do, sure, yeah. It's a, it's a big part Not of while it. I'm writing, though. Right. I don't do that. But... Uh, I think any, any writer would do well to um, listen to a couple of Bach fugues in the morning when he gets up before he starts writing. It, it clarifies the mind. And in, but actually, you spoke of notation. In that speech of, uh, by Tobias mm -hmm. in uh, Delicate Balance, you have, you have caps in certain places. Oh, you I do, say indeed. that it's very muted in other places. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I, so I, hear, I hear it as, uh, very specifically, and I put down exactly what I hear. You spoke about writing, that you didn't listen to music while you were writing. Where... You know, where the, I don't know the point. Uh, writing, a, a play and a piece of music are both made up of sound and silence, which is very different from a novel or, or, or a Absolutely. painting or anything else. And it's sound and silence. And silence can be just as important sometimes oh, as the sound. certainly can be. What is not said, uh, the evasion, <coughs> avoidance, of course. You spoke about when you were writing that you did not write while music was playing. Where and when do you write best? You have a home in Montauk mm -hmm. uh, at the end of Long Island. You uh, have a, a big loft downtown. Loft in, in, downtown in New York Man City, New and York I spend City. most of my life on airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> I used Where, to... At what time of day and under what circumstances and what places do you find you write best? Necessity is the best place to write, I think. Um, it really doesn't matter then? It doesn't matter all that much. I used to write very well in ocean liners, but they've taken most of them out of service. I write quite well in airplanes. I've spent a lot of time on long airplane flights. I get a lot of writing done Do on you? airplanes. Yeah. Um, 
It's nice to get out to Montauk and have a few months and be able to concentrate on a piece. It's best to write in the morning before I find something more useful to do, like go for the mail or something like that, yeah. You usually write in the morning. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Montauk, this just reminded me of something mm. quite different, but I wanted to ask you about. At Montauk, I think you have a, a writer's foundation and a it's writer's... Not, it's, it's a foundation not only for writers, uh, though we have a lot of writers, but we have composers and painters and sculptors as well. Uh, it's a place where they can come and live and work uh, communally. Uh, I have about a total of 25 there every summer. It's do, been going on for over 20 years now. Has it really? Yeah. Well, now, do people apply for this, or are they, they nominated? They sure do. Or what? No, no. I get about three or 400 applications do a you year. Really? Yeah. From writers, composers, sculptors? Mm -hmm. Painters. And how do you decide who, who, who do you have? Well, since my second career is um, in, uh, in uh, the fine arts, in, in the visual arts, I, I, I curate museum and gallery shows, and, and I've accumulated a fair number of contemporary artworks myself along the years, I make all the visual arts choices. And I farm the, um, and I can make the composer's choices too. I, I farm the playwrights and the novelists and the poets out to, uh, do you? to other people. You yeah. don't do the playwriting? No, no I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. Is that, why is that? That's, that's fascinating, that you wouldn't do the playwriting, just because you feel too close to it? Probably. Yeah. Hmm. But now you've, I just want to refer to one other thing, speaking of that, because it, in terms of your writing, there have been uh, throughout, ever, almost from the beginning, when you became well known and successful as a writer, you began to encourage other writers. You had the Playwrights Unit mm -hmm. in New York. Yeah. But Sh you and Clinton shouldn't Wilder. We do, shouldn't we do that? And, well, yes, but not everybody does. That's but true. you and Clinton Wilder and Richard Barr had a thing called the Playwrights Unit, mm -hmm. I believe, in which yeah, you we did. We did 120 plays in about uh, nine years there including the first productions of Sam Shepard and Terence McNally and Leroy Jones and John Guare and all sorts of other people. Amazing. Yeah. As I recall, you would let the playwright do whatever he or she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. You didn't dictate. It was, you... a play, it was the playwright's unit. If we found there was enough talent there, uh, we got actors and directors who'd work for free. Everybody worked for free. We didn't charge admission. We, it was a really good workshop and it went on for a long time and then other people got into the act yes, yes. and they started getting all the financing and so we just uh, realized it was all in in other hands and so we quit but we did a pretty good job well it was amazing i mean mm -hmm. look at all the people who came out of it you know the world would be a better place if if it were filled with good writers and good <laughs> good <laughs> painters and good composers but you've carried on then with the program yeah, that you have right, in yeah, terms sure. of the foundation and I, and I teach playwriting at the university of houston also and i found i've got each year, one or two uh, playwrights that I think stand a really good chance of, uh, of uh, continuing their careers and, and being significant, which how is nice. How many are in the class, in, the, in your playwriting class, do you have? In, uh, this you, year? You select I, them then? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I get about 100 applications and choose maybe a total of 12. Right. And of those 12, what? You're lucky if you get one or two. So that's one right. or two out of 100, which is, which is that's super. That's not, uh, listen, if they... And they, they may stop and, and go about their lives more sensibly than being playwrights, <laughs> but uh, they, they may go on, too. But that, it, I think it takes all of that encouragement, that environment, really, to produce uh, a, any kind of artist, don't you think? I mean, you have to provide the... Uh, if you can, if you if you can be some help, and you've got reasonably good taste and some talent, it's your responsibility to do it, of course. And, but and I think in this country we've had too little of that for a long, long time. Most of our art funding goes to performing organizations rather than individual creative artists, and that's too bad. You're speaking about state arts councils, the National Endowment for the Arts, yeah. these things. The edifice right. complex and all the rest of that stuff, yeah. Rather than dealing with individual, yeah. uh, individual mm -hmm. artists. That's right. But of course, that's what you've been trying to do yes. in, the, in, mm -hmm. the, in the foundation. Take is, up some of the stuff. Is swag. this deliberately, uh, deliberately then you deal with them as opposed to any kind of institutional mm -hmm. thing here? Yeah, well, we, I guess we are an institution. But you are, but you're... <laughs> a, a place that provides the place for people to for, get together and work. Yeah. I want to change subjects mm -hmm. uh, entirely to talk about the content of some of the plays um, and certain themes that run through your plays, certain ideas that you take up. Several of your plays, a number of your plays, are set in a, a well-to-do setting, uh, perhaps a living room of an upper middle class family. I'm thinking of all over, delicate balance. Uh, actually, if you want to take uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia mm -hmm. Woolf, 
the lady from Dubuque sure. are all set mm -hmm. in this. And it seems to me you have families in there. It's usually a family situation, uh, a husband and a wife, maybe with children, certainly with friends in most of these cases. You juxtapose a very civil, a very kind of um, people are very polite to each other. People have all the amenities. They have drinks before dinner and so forth. And the conversation is an uh, intelligent conversation for the most part. And you juxtapose to that a world that is much more in turmoil or much darker than that veneer, perhaps, mm -hmm. of, of the society. Is that, was that, is that a fair formulation yeah, of a lot seem, of your that places? That seems to hit a couple of them. You know. <laughs> of course, you've got to put a play either indoors or outdoors. And I've done a lot of them outdoors, too, yes. you know. Well, Seascape and Zoo well, Story. Uh, sa and sandbox is outdoors. Sandbox. Zoo Story is outdoors. Seascape is outdoors. Listening is outdoors. Box and quotations from Chairman Mao Zedong is on the back deck of an ocean liner. A lot of them are outdoors, too. <laughs> but yes, you're quite right about a number of them. They are indoors, and they are in living rooms. But I was thinking, in addition to the setting and the, the place, uh, of, of this juxtaposition between a veneer of society and... Uh, affability and civility and something really beneath the surface. You know where I think that all may come from? Well, probably two places. Chekhov, of course. But I think it may also come from a playwright who I don't think is a very great playwright, but whose work in, uh, influenced me profoundly, and that's T.S. Eliot. Oh, really? Think about the family reunion. Yes. Think about that. Think about, think about a cocktail party. Uh, plays like that probably influenced uh, those decisions that I made a good deal. There is there is the beating of the of, of the great dark wings right outside the window of the uh, of the cultivated living room. And of course, in T. S. Eliot's case, uh, the, the cocktail party. I mean, the name. It was the it was that whole ambience mm -hmm. that yes. we're talking yeah. about. So I wouldn't be surprised, but that uh, that was uh, a lot of it came from that. That's fascinating. Mm. But obviously, there's something. Uh, that you must perceive that's very American about that in terms of the set of the... I guess so. I guess, I guess my plays are American. I never <coughs> quite understand it. But they're set in the United States, and, and, they're, and, they're, and I'm an American playwright, therefore they're, they're clearly American. I guess I'm interested in the um, stripping away of the veneer of uh, uh, the establishment of the, uh, the people who really, really secretly control our society and our government and, uh, and our culture. Well, you've always been, I think, a, a bit of a maverick, an iconoclast. In your, I mean, you have yourself. Well, see, I, but I, mean, I was, as you know, may know, remember, remember, I was adopted into a fairly wealthy family, um, all of whose values ran totally counter to the values that I seemed to develop very naturally. They were, they were reactionary Republicans. <laughs> I became a left-wing Democrat. Uh, they, they, they were filled with, with prejudices, and therefore I, I went the opposite way. Um, Obviously, I'm anxious to, to expose a lot of that and, 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 and strip some things naked. Actually, there are a lot of young people who grow up in an atmosphere like that who are not adopted, who have the same sort of uh, reaction to the, the setting, you to, know, the, when you're to, the, to wealth you know, or whatever. You keep hoping that you write plays and people will stop behaving the way they do. But I'm afraid our country is made up now, even more than it used to be now of people who prefer the veneer, who uh, prefer the uh, there seems to be a younger, comfortable life. There's a younger generation coming along who act like a lot of the, mm. the older people in your place. They do. I guess I can keep right on at work then. <laughs> You've got to, let me, there was something you mentioned a moment ago. We talked about you being an American playwright, because mm. clearly... Uh, a play like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, The American Dream, these are well, obviously yeah, well, the sure. name, these are, there's a, and then you mentioned this question of values, and even now, some of this is coming back again, I mean, mm -hmm. or it's, it's sort of... Uh, I don't think it, it ever went very far no, away. No, it probably didn't. No, we uh, had the illusion of but, it in the early 60s that yes. it was going to be different, but it was But wasn't. you spoke to, uh, we, we talked about Europe a little, and, and you mentioned this, your play is actually, a zoo story was first done, not in this country, but first in First done in West Berlin, yeah. How did that happen, anyway? What was that? Well, there was no off-Broadway when I wrote the zoo story. Nobody seemed particularly interested in a, an hour-long, fairly odd play by an unknown American playwright. But they were in Europe, and it made from a, a friend of mine in the United States sent it to a friend of his in Florence, who sent it to a friend of his in Zurich, who sent it to a friend in um, Frankfurt. 
who sent it to somebody else in Berlin, the play got, yeah. got done. And a number of my plays I've noticed over the years, especially the more difficult ones, seem to be more popular in Europe than they are in this country. This is why I raised the question a few minutes ago, am I an American playwright? Yeah, yes, I, yes, I guess I am. But I, I've had a lot more sympathetic response to a number of my plays uh, in Europe than I have in this country. And that's been true. Some of your plays I, have been much uh, better received, much bigger successes abroad mm. than they have in this country, yes, haven't they? Yes. So, am I an American? Well, obviously there's a certain sensibility there that yeah. uh, is... There's a willingness on the part of a larger part of the theater audience to, to sit still and, and, uh, and, and, and examine a, a play which is uh, perhaps not absolutely straightforward and naturalistic and is examining some tricky problems. It seems to me that your plays uh, do make certain demands on the audience, and maybe that's the wrong word. They, 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 they expect an intelligent, alert audience because you, there are ideas afloat. Mm -hmm. There are uh, sometimes... I try uh, to hide them, you understand. The, I understand, but there are ideas there. That, but these are intelligent people in many cases mm -hmm. who are talking. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. they're confused, sometimes their values are wrong, but they're intelligent people. There are ideas there. Uh, the language sometimes is, uh, has to be listened to very carefully mm -hmm. in the plays. Uh, and then there are juxtapositions of certain things. In Tiny Alice, you've got a model of the house in which all of this is taking place. Mm -hmm. You've got the question of whether Miss Alice is really Alice or is someone who is playing the role. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of role playing in some of your oh, plays. Sure there is, yes. uh, people take other people's places and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Uh, this requires something, the audience has to bring something to the play. I've never understood why anybody would want to go to any artistic experience, read a book, see a play, listen to a piece of music, look at a piece of painting, and not come away changed in some way, not, not having had an experience that was worth the time and worth the expense. Uh, and any play that I go to that leaves me unchanged from the person I was when I went in is an absolute waste of time. Life is short, you know. Uh, stay home and turn the mind into cream of wheat on, on <laughs> network TV. Why, why go to the theater? Serious arts are there to uh, keep us awake and make us think differently about things. Do you think I'm wondering in terms of not only your plays, but particularly your plays, but other plays as well, Strindberg, as you know, in the, toward in, in the latter part of his life, uh, developed a, a theater, the intimate theater, specifically for some of his plays, which he felt were not really going to be huge uh, co commercial successes mm -hmm. or accepted by a wide audience. Do you think we need something like that uh, in this country? I mean, it seems to me some of your plays would, would in a setting like that, could find uh, an audience that responded if, just yes. the way we've been talking. If we didn't feel in this country that a play in a small theater is somehow less worthy of our attention than a play in a big theater and, that it, uh, and all the rest of it, if we didn't feel that. Do you think some of that's beginning to be broken down in terms of, let's say, in New York, off-Broadway, because uh, right now, in this period of time, off-Broadway is more stimulating than Broadway. Oh, and off-off-Broadway is more stimulating yeah. than off-Broadway. So, well, don't you think... And the best theater is done in the small theaters in the major cities and the regional theaters. There's very, very little that's done on Broadway now uh, that's worth anybody's attention. Well, well, you know you, that better than I do. Don't you think that there, there is a change then, perhaps, in terms of the acceptance of a medium-sized theater or a, a smaller theater? As There's a kind of unfairness about it. Why, why should a playwright have to be a second-class economic citizen? Right. In terms of the money you yeah. get. Well, yeah, everybody likes to make a living. You know. And in, in these smaller theaters, you cannot make the same kind of money you can in Well, a... nobody wants to be greedy either. Yes. <laughs> but, but at the same time, I, I think it's unfortunate that, um, well, let me just invent two names here, uh, Neil Simon and Samuel Beckett, just to invent a couple of names. Right. Um, Neil Simon is a very good playwright, so is Samuel Beckett a very good playwright. I have a preference between the two, but that's just me. I would imagine that Neil Simon's plays are a thousand times more popular uh, th than Samuel Beckett's plays are. And uh, while well, Beckett isn't starving, Simon is an enormously wealthy man. Uh, we judge too much by, uh, by how much money something earns in this country. But at the same time, I, uh, it's a shame when, when high art, 
must be penalized economically in the marketplace for being high art. And, th and this still happens far too much in this country. Do you think that some of this has to do with the m mindset in terms of subsidy? And this, uh, European countries are much more accustomed to subsidizing artistic enterprises than we are. Do you think that's part no, of it? No, I think it's basically because we wish art to be escape rather than engagement. We wish the arts to not uh, criticize us. We don't want them to raise difficult problems. We want uh, uh, an, uh, an, uh, basically empty entertaining time and we, and we will reward the practitioner of that. And you have stuck stubbornly to the... Oh, come on. If I knew how to sell out, I'd probably do it. <laughs> no, you would I don't think you would. Well... I mean, you've never... Have you been ever been tempted to, to write uh, for films? or no, tele You haven't no, been. No, no. I mean, because these would be obvious places to go. I mean, you've well, stayed with the I, theater I'm from... I'm stubborn, you see. I like to be my own boss. I just used the word stubborn in your question. <laughs> I like to be my own boss. And I know that if I were going to be a film writer or a TV writer, I'd be told what to do. And, I, and, I'd, and I'd rather make my own mistakes rather than somebody else's. Also, you can try things in theater that, being your own boss, you can decide if you're going to have two lizards as you did yeah, in Seascape, yes. or if you're going to, uh, in a play like uh, The Lady from Dubuque, you have, there's a woman dying, Joe, and you have this woman who comes on, Elizabeth, and she comes on, but she's white, she comes on with a black man, Oscar, and they almost become like parents to mm -hmm. her in some... Yeah, well, the whole play, is, as, as you remember, is, is about relative realities here. Who's, the, the truth must lie in, 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 in reality need. And Joe, the dying person, needs Elizabeth to be her mother, even though everybody in the world knows that she's not, but therefore she must be, and therefore she becomes. The play was an examination of, of, of relative <coughs> realities and reality need, and, and therefore, you know, it sank without a trace pretty quickly. <laughs> but are you still fond of it? Yeah, I like it but a lot. But is it, is it done? I see it now and again. Is it yes. done? Is, now, is that one that was... It gets done in Europe. It's been I'm done just... in a few regional theaters. It got a lovely production at the Hartford Stage Company uh, uh, shortly, uh, not shortly, but a few years after it closed in New York. That, that was a splendid production. I've seen a couple of productions in Europe that were lovely. But you were able to do things in that that you couldn't have done any place else, namely have... Well, I wouldn't have been able to do those things on a Broadway production either had I not had Richard Barr as my producer, a, a man who uh, f had the odd feeling that that which uh, has some value should be put on Broadway. And so he, you know, plus a suicidal bent, obviously, <laughs> oh, economically suicidal he would. Uh, but he had people who were willing to, to lose a fortune on my plays. But uh, he produced it on Broadway, and, and so I was able to do what I needed or wanted to do uh, without hindrance. Right. The, we were speaking of Europe a minute ago. I just wanted to ask you one mm -hmm. question about that. Your plays being done there, aren't they, how much are they done in Eastern Europe behind the so-called I, I, I was in Istanbul um, about a year ago at a, at a theater conference with Soviet, by some of my Soviet theater friends, uh, some Americans and a few Turkish theater people. And one of the Soviet theater people handed me a list of 80 productions of plays of mine in the Soviet Union really? in the last 10 years. And if you've got no royalties? Of course not. No productions. And I didn't even know any of the productions were taking place. Do you think now in the era of I think, I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a little better. I think American playwrights may start getting some royalties and may even be told uh, when their plays are going to be done and may even be allowed to see a translation. But How you've never that? seen, you don't know who's translated these. No, no, because nobody sends me the translation. I think you told me once that your plays had been done a great deal in Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. and that what they did was accumulate a fund for you. You, you have to go there to spend the money. You, is that? I, I, every country is different. I think I get half of the money out in, uh, in Western currency and the rest uh, resides in Czechoslovakia. But whenever I go there, I go around and, and, and see the work of young painters and sculptors and, and I use my blocked currency to, 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 buy, to, buy, oh, to, to buy, buy, paintings? buy art. Yeah. Well, now, what about some of the other, Poland or uh, Hungary or those places? Do you have any idea what happens there? Uh, Poland, uh, I, can't, I get them all mixed up. Hungary, I believe, sends all the money out. Uh, Bulgaria and Romania don't tell you anything about anything. And Poland is complex. 
Which of the of the countries in Western Europe or England? I mean, Germany, your plays get done a great deal. Yes. France, Italy, England. A fair amount in Italy, and uh, uh, some in Spain. Um, now the National Theatre. A good deal in England. In England, they've done a good deal. Oh, I they've think. done quite a few between the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company. I must have had oh, 12 plays done there. Were some of those productions? Have you seen most of the production? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about them as in terms of realizing the plays? Have you felt that they really, because you used, for instance, in Tiny Alice in this country, you used Irene Worth and John Gilgood. Well, you, Irene, of course, is, is from Montana. Or yes, somewhere. but she's trained, let's face it, and, she's and, and John, trained all yes, of her yes, she was. life in England. And, uh, I've had superb productions in, uh, uh, in, in England. I've worked with some of the most wonderful actors, uh, Gilgood and... and Peggy Ashcroft and, 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 and so many others. I had a wonderful, wonderful experience. In Don't you think the ability to handle language is one reason that they do well with your plays? I would certainly think so, yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's they do not, they don't, don't seem perplexed by uh, uh, tripart sentences anyway. <laughs> With a few clauses here, yeah, and there. Don't, the clauses it, don't it, seem to bother them too much. Interspersed with yeah. them, how do you how do you feel these audiences respond to the family situations, to the personal interaction in your plays? I uh, haven't found that my plays are as exotic in Europe as as, as Tennessee Williams plays are, for example. Really? They don't seem to be as exotic my, because mine are not uh, as as regional, I guess. As yes, some other like plays his are or southern. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my plays seem to translate into the, into the culture of, of, of foreign and countries the, fairly well. Those relationships, for instance, you have a lot of husband and wife situations, mm -hmm. a lot of parents and children situations. Mm -hmm. So those uh, translate are accepted. No problem. To deal with Czechoslovakia for a moment, when they did Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, since nobody in Czechoslovakia had ever heard of Virginia Woolf, the only change they made was to change the title to Who's Afraid of Franz Kafka. And I was in Prague a few years ago, and there was a production of Seascape at uh, Havel's Theatre, uh, which unfortunately he was not even permitted to get into anymore. He's out of jail again, fortunately. Yes. Um, dear man, brave good man. Um, there was, they were doing a production of Seascape at the Balustrade Theatre in Prague, which had been running, in, when I saw it, had been running in repertory for two and a half years. But what they'd done they had made it very, very clear in the staging of it that the human characters were Czech, but the lizard spoke Czech with a slightly Russian accent. That's marvelous. Isn't that marvelous? On that, that story, so I'm afraid we have to end right here. This has gone all too quickly. This has been the Harold Clerman Seminar in Theater. I'm Ed Wilson, and my guest has been playwright Edward Albee.